Hi, this is Michael William Denny of Thundershamanism.com, and today we're going to talk about another chapter in the book, The Thunder Wizard Path. And this was my second uh, published book, my first book in this, you know, this entire uh, discipline that I've been creating about, um, you know, Teutonic Thunder Shamanism. And so and now we're going to talk about uh, the eight directions and the nine worlds. And again, uh, going from the previous video, which by the way, if you haven't watched, go ahead and watch the other videos in the series. Uh, we talked about the five elements. And I talked to you about that the five elements are not some symbolic, arbitrary thing that's kind of cute. They're real, there's, they're real things that exist in the universe. And that multiple traditions have come to the same conclusion about what the elements are and where they exist in terms of the directions what deities are connected with them, which planets are connected with them. It's the same, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, you know, or, and even with the Germanic tribes, it's all the same. So that means that this is a science. This is not just fun. This is not just to play around in your imagination. And so if you really want to make uh, headway in any kind of energetic discipline, you have to understand it's a science. And so that's my point here is that, you know, not only is this a very powerful exercise, but it's something that the ancestors have known for many, many thousands of years. And so by reconnecting and recreating it, we can have the power that they had. So that's really what I'm all about. And that's what this book is all about. So, um, so we talked about the five elements. We found that the five elements, not only are they the same, you know, the Chinese call them a little different. They call uh, ether, wood, and they call uh, air, metal, but the rest are the same, fire, water, and earth. <clears throat> we also found that they uh, reside in the same direction. And this is found not only in Taoist and in Hindu, but it also in the uh, tribal Germanic myths. You have water in the north, the mist world. You have fire in the south, which is the fire home. You have Ether in the east, which is the giant home, the force of expansive energy, which is what ether is. And then you have um, wind uh, in the west, or metal, which is uh, the Vanir. The Vanir, uh, when you read uh, the myths, Vanir are directly connected to wind. They experience everything on the earth through the power of wind. So if a spirit comes into the room and whew, wind blows it open, there's a pretty good chance that you've got uh, an earth spirit there because that's how they travel. They travel through wind. So, uh, and of course you have Middle Earth which is in the center, in the middle. So you have the five elements. All of these cultures agree. Uh, water in the north, fire in the south, ether in the east, um, wind in the west, earth in the center. So that means this is a science. Now, what about the nine worlds? So when we understand that, we can figure out where the nine worlds are as well. Now, um, as it turns out, uh, you find this in the Bagua. This, that's the Chinese version of it. I won't get too in-depth in that because the symbolism is very different. But when you look at the symbolism, they're saying the same thing. Each of the nine worlds, uh, the eight worlds in the center, uh, the qualities are exactly the same. And so when we combine the traditions, we actually get a, an even deeper in-depth understanding, which goes on multiple layers. They're very... Um, cooperative, they're very, they work together extremely well. And this is what really expanded my knowledge because I'd worked in uh, Taoist traditions for a long time. But to be honest with you, the symbolism was a little beyond me. I didn't realize it, but I didn't quite understand what the symbolism was of the eight gates um, until I looked at the nine worlds in the uh, Western tradition and in the Hindu tradition. Same thing in the Hindu tradition, the eight directions, the, the associations there and the energies there, the elements there are identical to both the European and uh, the Taoist. So we're focusing specifically on the uh, tribal Germanic tradition. So we have the eight directions, which correspond with the eight worlds. And of course, the ninth would be the middle, which is Midyard, uh, Middle Earth. Uh, Midgard, and that's where humans live. So Earth is in the center, and that's where Midgard is. So starting uh, clockwise in the north, very clear that, uh, that we have the mist world in the north. Now we have Asgard. Now the myths aren't really clear as to exactly where Asgard is, but um, by looking at the other traditions, it's very clear that Asgard is going to be in the northeast. This is the realm of the highest heaven. This is the realm of the celestial gods. This is where Odin and uh, Frigga and all of the gods congregate. This is where the gods meet. This is the realm of the highest ether. 
So you're in between water and ether. And so uh, it's a very high concentration of ether. It's in the, and it's also the highest realm. This is why it's, you know, it's on, the, on mountaintops, you know, or in the heavens, because it's very high vibrational stuff. It's, for the most part, a little too high vibrational energy for us humans. Um, but uh, this is where we get, get our inspiration. It's perfection. It's timeless perfection, and that's what the gods are all about. Asgard is a yard. It's a fortress, and there's only two fortresses um, in the nine worlds. I think there's only two, but one of them is Asgard, or the fortress of the gods, and that's because the gods want to, to keep their timeless perfection. They don't want it to be um, destroyed or sullied in any way. So that's the northeast. We go in, uh, in, uh, in a clockwise direction, we get to the east, which we've already talked about is the realm of the giants, the realm of the home of ether. So uh, ether is in the east, and the giants are in the east, and that's where Thor is. And Thor spends all of his time in the east fighting the giants, which is what? Which is expansive energy, energy that expands without limits, which refers to conscious awareness that does not take into account anything else, which is what the giants are. I mean, when you look at fairy tales, what are giants? They're these one-eyed giants walking around, stomping on people's homes, picking people up and biting their heads off. They're just completely clueless that anything exists. They're just all about their own, their own lusts, their own desires. And so this is why Thor is out there. And Thor is a god of the mind. People don't understand this, but Thor is a god of the mind. And he is about mental uh, evolution. And his name means Lord of the Mind, Thunar. Thu is another word for moon, which is the mind. It's also life force energy. He's Lord of the life force energy. He is Lord of the Mind. So uh, he's all about conscious awareness. And so the, the symbolism of him fighting the trolls and the giants in the East is him seeking to evolve us out of our reptilian brain. We could go on and on and on. But that's... Uh, that's what the East is, and that's, uh, that's where Thor is. That's the, the realm of thunder and lightning and uh, the, the land of the giants. Now, that's very clear in the myths. Now we get to another one uh, that's not so clear, which is in the Southeast. The Southeast is the dwarf home. Now, what are dwarves? I talk about this at length. I won't spend all the time doing it here, but the dwarves are entities of pure emotional consciousness it's first before we have consciousness we have emotions now people you know talk about animals as though they don't have emotions animals totally have emotions they don't have consciousness in the way that we do they're not as self-aware as we are but they absolutely have emotions and so dwarves are the evolution of emotions working towards conscious awareness and so, you know, that's why the dwarves are the master of magic. They're the master of manifestation. They create all kinds of magic, which means that there's power in emotions. That's a whole other video in and of itself. You learn to master your emotions, you can create anything, magical or otherwise. So um, they, that is the realm of meditation in the sense of, you know, harnessing emotions and power and consciousness together. That's, that's the realm of of contemplation, meditation. It's a very magical place. And the Chinese call it the human door, which means that's where we become human, where our emotions start to evolve into conscious awareness. That's what makes us human. So that's the southeast, the dwarf home. And we get to the south, which is the fire home. This is the home of the demon Sirt, who is uh, the demon of pure mindless destruction. And it has to do with, uh, what is that word? Um, I'll remember it's another, another time. But, um, you know, fire, once it's released, you can't put it back, which is what global warming is, by the way. You know, once you release that, you can't put it back. You know, while we're on the subject, people talk about stopping global warming. Well, let me be clear about something. It's too late. You can't stop it. It's already started. Uh, and all of the gases that have been released in the atmosphere um, it's cumulative. Even if we were to halt all um, greenhouse gas emissions, good luck with that, that's not going to happen. But even if we were capable of doing that, actually I should say, you know, I, I hope that does happen. But even if we were to do that, 
global warming would still increase for hundreds of years because those gases are still you know beginning to heat and that takes it takes a long time so it's not like if we stopped you know uh, greenhouse gas emissions that all of a sudden temperatures would go back to normal no it's too late we've let that cat out of the bag we can't put it back now that has to run its course whatever it is so get used to it you know scientists have now said that you know we've passed uh, the realm where you know when I was a kid, we're never going to go back to those temperatures again. That's gone. Doesn't mean that we're not going to have fluctuations of, you know, highs and lows. That's going to happen. There's going to be lows and highs and, you know, snowstorms and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It means that the mean temperature, the average temperature, is above where it's ever been. It's never going back. So unless there's some kind of ice age or something like that that comes in, you know, get used to things being warmer. So... That's the realm of uh, the south, which is the fire home. The southwest is the realm of the underworld, or what we call hell. Hell, H-E-L, is where we get the modern word for hell. The Christians uh, hijacked it and used it uh, for themselves to describe the underworld. They described it as a place of eternal punishment where the devil and his angels uh, are tortured forever and ever, and human beings that didn't accept you know, the Abrahamic tradition and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, regardless of what they did in their life or how wonderful they were, they're going to spend eternity burning in the underworld, which they call hell. But hell is not a place of uh, damnation. It is the place of uh, reincarnation. Now, according to the Germanic tribal tradition, uh, a warrior who died in battle, which meant anybody who lived completely and fearlessly and enjoyed their life, they will go to Valhalla, the Hall of the Chosen. Um, that, is the, that is the Germanic understanding of enlightenment. You, know, you've, you don't have to be reincarnated again. But if you die in illness, which means you die attached to your illusions, whatever they may be, then you get to go to the underworld and you get to work through that. Now, there are places of torment in the underworld, um, but it's self-induced. And the goddess Hela, who is the queen of the underworld, she will stand by and let you punish yourself for as long as you want. This is the great thing about her. She has no agenda. She doesn't care what you do. She has, she has the purest of love and acceptance, meaning she'll let you do whatever you need to do. If you want to torture yourself for thousands of years, she'll stand by and let you do it. It won't bother her at all. When you're ready to move on and let go, she's right there waiting for you. This is why she's half and half. Half of her is a decaying body and the other half is this young woman. The decaying body represents us hanging on to old patterns that are actually old and musty and decomposing. That's why we see her that way. That means you're still attached. If you see her as a corpse, you're still attached to your illusions. And that's what hell is about. It's the underworld helping you work through that. If you see her as this beautiful young uh, woman, then that means that you're ready to be reborn. You've let go of the old and you see her for what she truly is. This is what Kali is too, by the way. You know, um, That's another subject. But all these goddesses of death, are really about, you know, the fearsome side of them is, is means that when she comes to you and you see her in whatever form with, you know, tongue hanging out and skulls like in Kali, or if you see her as this, uh, this uh, corpse, then that means that you're still attached and she's come to, to liberate you from that and it's going to be challenging experience for you. It's going to be frightening. That's why death frightens us. So that's hell. So moving to the west, we have the home of the Vanir, the home of the Wanes, the home of the, the elder gods. And they're elder because they're further along, they're going in a, in a, excuse me, in a clockwise fashion, and we're getting to the west, so they're, you know, farther along in that process of evolution. They're also gods of fertility, which means they live in time and space, which means that's what gives them the status of the elder gods, because they live in time. They have wisdom because they have experience, because they've been around a long time. As opposed to the Aesir, who are the timeless gods. They're like children. They never age because they live in this timeless perfection. So that's the difference between them. That's why the, um, the Vanir are the elder gods, the gods of wisdom. So that's the West. Then we move into the Northwest, which is again not clear in the myths where this world is. But when we look at other traditions, it's very clear that the Northwest is the elf home. 
The elves are not little tiny sprites that run around with pointy hats and make toys for Santa. The elves are the shining ones. That's what, the, that's what elf means. It means shining one. Um, that's where, where the word Alps comes from. The Alps, you know, in especially in uh, Ice Age times, were completely covered in ice. They must have been these, this incredibly bright, shining thing. You know, that's why they called them the Alps. Um, and so the elves are the shining ones, and they are the human ancestors who have achieved uh, perfection, enlightenment, whatever, and they're about to merge back into the void. And so they stand at the gate and they look back on humanity and they teach humanity. These are the elves, the shining ones. And this is why they're so revered in uh, uh, mythology. And that's in the Northwest. So those are the, nine, uh, the eight directions in the nine worlds. If you're interested, go ahead and click on the link for um, the book uh, Thunder Wizard Path. Go ahead and click on the link for Celestial Qigong, the most powerful energy work I've ever done. You want to be a master shaman? That's a great way to do it. Celestial Qigong. You can click on the Hula Breath, which is in the book as well. Uh, and if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship, which means nothing more than we work on a weekly basis for an hour, and I can teach you how to take all this information and use it to become a powerful master shaman, uh, click on apprenticeship. So that's it for now, my friends. Until next time.